Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Howdy. Yeah, it is a good morning, isn't it? Um, just before I start, let me warn you ahead of time, in the last couple of weeks, Alice Kay and I have had the creeping crud, I guess is what you call it. We are not really sick, traditionally, and haven't had any temperature, but we sound like a couple of basset hounds coughing and, and, and are as weak as a kitten. And uh, beyond that, so if I start coughing, um, you can talk to each other for a little bit, and then we'll start again. But it, it's been um, more irritating than it has anything else. But I'm told that it is, at, it, it, in the initial outset, is really contagious because Paula swears that I gave it to her. So I don't know. We're in the last chapter, or the last of the seven churches that Jesus picked as illustrations for what he wanted to say to the churches of all time. The church here in the third chapter of the book of Revelation, and I would encourage you to have that in front of you as well as uh, the sermon outline itself because you will notice, and I'll repeat this again, that in each of these churches, what Jesus did was he took a local situation, sometimes a local person, but more often than not, a, a something that was indigenous to that particular area where the church was located, and he used it as an illustration. Now, Jesus did this all the time. In fact, it was a, it was a traditional method used by the rabbis. You take something that everybody understands locally and you use that to illustrate something that you want the people to understand about the church or spiritual lesson. When Jesus did it, it they were called parables. When you were in vacation Bible school 900 years ago, a parable was described as an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. When And Jesus did that Routinely, he would, as you recall, he, he, he would say, you know, the foxes have their dens and the birds have their nests, but the Son of God has no place to lay his head. He doesn't have a nest or whatever. Probably at that time, there was either a bird flying over or a fox running by, and he would use that to illustrate what he wanted to teach. That was the method that was most popular among the rabbis. Here in the church at Laodicea, this is especially true. He uses about six different things that the city itself is noted for to, to, uh, to teach a spiritual lesson. The church at Laodicea is the only one of the seven churches that Jesus had not a single good thing to say about. Not one. Actually, there's been some confusion among pseudo-scholars, the people who know just enough to be dangerous. There were actually six different cities in the ancient Roman world with the name Laodicea. This particular congregation was located in, <coughs> excuse me, in a city that was designated as Laodicea on the Lycus. The Lycus uh, was, an, uh, was a river and an area there uh, where it was located. This, the, the term Laodicea was named when Alexander the Great conquered most of that, all that world clear over into uh, India. He, when he died, those who succeeded him were generals that had fought for him. And one of them's name was Antiochus. Antiochus ruled over the area of Syria, and he was the one who became notorious <coughs> as Antiochus of Epiphanes because he uh, tried to uh, sacrifice a pig in the temple at Jerusalem 
And that didn't go over real good because pigs and Jews don't get along very well. <coughs> I have to take a snort. I, went, I thought, <coughs> and by the way, whoever left this stuff up here, the sweet smelling stuff for me, I got the message. I didn't know I smelled that bad, but I will use it if it helps you. I guess it was there for that purpose. I don't know. Anyway, Antiochus' wife's name was Laodicea, and that became the basis of several, where he was known of several cities that were named after his wife, Laodicea, and it became Laodicea. This particular city was of extreme wealth one of the richest cities in the Roman Empire. And there were several reasons for it, as we'll see in just a minute. It was actually so rich that they had a horrible earthquake at one time. And that whole section of Turkey is known for earthquakes, even today. And the entire city was obliterated. It just was leveled. They were so wealthy that they rebuilt the city with their own resources. Rome actually said, can we help you? And they said, no, we don't need any help. We can do it all of our own. They were that wealthy. I think I told you before that Alice Kay and I spent time as a youth minister <clears throat> in Columbus, Indiana, at the Tabernacle Church there, Tabernacle Christian Church, and, and um, Columbus, Indiana, during the Depression, during that time, my dad said if he had a job working for 50 cents a day and was glad to get it. Columbus, Indiana hardly even noticed that there was a Great Depression. It was the, it is at the center of Cummins Engine which probably is one of the best engines in the whole world. See them in trucks in particular. It's the home of, uh, of a large company that made baby furniture. It was at that time the home of Arvin Industries. When we were growing up, Arvin Industries made all kinds of electrical, electrical stuff, including radios. Union Starch, Irwin Union Bank just continued to operate as though there were no problems. The family, that, the number one family there who made all their money, believe it or not, with a toll road back early on were just extremely wealthy. They had four million dollars, the, the church where I served, had $4 million in the savings account and uh, asked them, you know, why don't you use that for missions or do something? And they said, well, you remember, and I, this was in the trustees meeting, and I remember what they said. Oh, he said, you remember in the Old Testament with Joseph, there were seven lean years and da-da-da. So this is in case we have seven lean years. That didn't set very good with yours truly, but that's, that was how wealthy that area was. And the, and the Irwin Miller Sweeney family that had all the money tried to hire me as a youth minister for North Christian Church. I didn't take it because I, I wanted to do something else. And at that particular time, Irwin Miller said that the family was worth somewhere around $750 million. Now, you can get by on that if you don't tip too heavy. And that, that, that's how wealthy that whole area, and they were just the most wealthy. There were lots of others around there, too. There were 12 guys who sat on our board of trustees, all of whom were multimillionaires. The problem at Laodicea was somewhat comparable to that. You would look at it and say, man, oh, man. They were the luckiest people in the world. <clears throat> but they were the only church of the seven mentioned here. As I said, 
that Jesus had not one good thing to say about. There's real danger in wealth because we have a natural tendency to trust in wealth rather than to trust in the Lord. This area had become so wealthy that they didn't, they thought we don't need God. So we've got to be real careful, both as individuals and as a congregation, that our primary object objective isn't to see how wealthy we can get. Our primary responsibility for being here is to see how godly we can get, regardless of what the world says. This whole thing took place probably in the writing of the book somewhere in the late uh, part of the first century, Und probably under the leadership of the most vicious of all of the Roman dictators named Domitian. He served from 81 to at 96, and I'm, I, I would guess if I were to put a date here on when he's writing about it, it would probably be around 95 A.D. Now let's read the text and see what he has to say. To the angel of the church at Laodicea, the angel meaning, anybody remember? Say messenger. You didn't say it. It's the, the word angel means messenger. And here it's generally stated that the messenger to whom Jesus is addressing his message is probably to the preacher at that church. Even though some of the commentators say it could very well have been a real angel, a guardian angel for the church, because there are such things. He goes on to say, these are the words of the amen. He's talking about himself here, Jesus himself. The faithful and the true witness. Why does he use this word witness? The Greek word or for the word witness here, um, uh, both in the Old Testament and New Testament and in our own judicial system, requires three things of a witness, two of which are absolutely essential. One is that the witness must have seen what he is talking about. A lot of what we're talking about here in the, uh, must have visibly have seen himself, not second-handed, but him personally have seen what took place. Much of what he's going to write about here is heaven. And Jesus is the only one who has actually been there and done that and seen that and can speak about what heaven is like. Second thing that a witness had to have in order to be a creditable witness in court and, and even in our judicial system, not only must he have seen personally what he's talking about, but he must be capable of telling what he has seen. And Jesus, of course, is in the process of telling it. That's what the Bible is. It is what Jesus saw and brings to earth and shares with us. So he's really talking about himself as a faithful or creditable witness, the ruler of God's creation. He says, I know your deeds. I know your deeds. Remember this, that Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be there with you. The... the presence of the Lord in our life as a born-again believer, born from above, born of the Spirit, means that God is with us, and that's why Jesus was called what? Emmanuel, God with us. If we could only remember and never forget the consistent always presence of the Spirit of God in our life, wherever we go, whatever we do. Many of the problems within the church and within our world would quickly go away. Then he goes on and he mentions something that unless someone had done their homework, you wouldn't catch. He says here, 
I know your deeds, that they are neither cold or hot. I wish that they were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, and this is a horrible thing to say, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spew you or spit you out of my mouth. Some of the translations, I believe even King James actually says, I will vomit you. He's talking about a problem that they had locally and using it as a vivid illustration of their spiritual condition. The city of Laodicea on the Lycus had no fresh water for drinking. Their water had to be transported from about five or six miles away by an aqueduct. An aqueduct was common in the Roman Empire. They looked something like this. And the water, there's, there was a place that was sealed with mud and other stuff and made it so they could actually run the, when it dried, run the water over it. This particular picture is one, if you were to go to Israel, you don't want to go now, but if you were to go there just north of the city of Caesarea, there is a large aqueduct that brought water, fresh water for drinking uh, from the mountains several miles away. Up the road, about five and a half to six miles from Laodicea were hot springs. That was the only water within 10 to 15 miles. So they, that was good enough for drinking. But that water was warm. And then by the time it came all the way down the aqueduct to them, it was awful. It was nauseating. It was tepid. As some, some of the, and so he is saying to them, just like the water you drank there that you have to bring down the aqueduct is lukewarm and not tasty, That's a pretty good description of the quality of your faith. You're lukewarm. If you don't think that that term is uh, distasteful, look your wife straight in the face sometime and say, Honey, you're just lukewarm. That didn't go over very well, but I, th I thought maybe it might at the time when I first thought of it. Tepid. He goes ahead then and talks about the city, as I told you, was extremely wealthy. One of the reasons, in spite of the water problem they had, one of the reasons it was wealthy, it was located on major highways. Wherever, even in our world today, wherever you see major interstates or major highways crossing, you will see prosperous cities. If you were to go, I'm aiming, if nothing happens, I've got to go to Nashville this week, and, and Nashville, Tennessee is a boom town. You've got major highways, going, interstate highways going east and west. You have them going north and south. You go to Columbus, you've got two major highways up there, and the Columbus is in the process of becoming a boom town. One of the chip sent, people who make chips for AI and other reasons, because everything runs by them, your silly telephones. And I don't want to get on the telephone thing because it's getting to be such a problem. Because TikTok has all of a sudden become the center of conversation. These little chips that go in the telephones where our youngsters work. And parents, if you have never watched TikTok, you should be taken out behind the barn and buggy whipped. That's the filthiest trash I have ever seen in my life. And I've seen some bad. I worked for years on a cast house floor in a steel mill with some of the orneries cusses on the face of the earth who would get had PhDs in profanity and filthy talk. And we have a tendency to take that kind of lightly. We've even had people attend church here who uh, 
thought it was really funny to tell off-color jokes as if the scripture somehow ignored that subject. It doesn't. If you look very closely at what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church regarding gross stuff, listen to what he said. This is in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. He said, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, of greed, because there's no... Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish or co- talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather we should be known for thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man is an idolater he idolizes things has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God that's as strong a talk as you could possibly have to talk about the necessity of Christians setting a higher standard in a pagan world that has no standards at all And TikTok, that I've observed, is worse. And I know it's become a political issue and probably a financial thing, too. It is the filthiest stuff on there. Filthier than anything that I ever heard on a cast house floor on a blast furnace. It shouldn't be in your home. So the city of Laodicea its presence in in the church in the presence of that city they were probably really well liked. They probably did a lot of good things because they had all kinds of money. But the relationship with the Lord and with one another were highly questionable. Well, worse than that, Jesus couldn't find any reason to compliment them for any reason. They were actually located not just on two major highways, but six. Six highways came. And so they became a a tremendously well-known commercial center. We'll talk about a little bit more of that as we go. Of the various, this week, in the last couple of weeks, I consulted seven different commentaries, all of whom believe the Bible. And I was wanting to see what their take was here on the city of Laodicea and why the Lord could find no compliment to give them. I looked at it, and, and, and every, uh, five out of the seven said that the situation in Western Europe, the church, situation of the church in Western Europe and in the USA today is more comparable to the church in Laodicea than any of the other seven churches, any of the other six churches. And they gave the reasons. They were saying that the church in the U.S. and especially Western Europe is, has t- almost totally lost its influence there. My brother lived next door to the church building in the door for the village where in Germany where he retired. And on Sundays when I was there, we would go to church and, and his son when my nephews would sit and whisper in my ear translate because it's all in German and if you had thrown a hand grenade in there in that church building about all you have gotten was splinters there weren't any of the local people there at all if it hadn't been for the choir 
because they had a because in in Germany the preacher is paid by the state. So they don't the local church doesn't have to so the money they took in they kept up the building and gave to the choir. The choir every year went to Israel for a week. I was in a it was an interesting situation so the choir loft was full but they weren't singing to anybody. My brother had a standing table at the local bar. And I was up there with him one night, one evening, and, and, uh, and the place was full. And all of a sudden, somebody came in, yakety, 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 yak, and everybody left except just those I was sitting at the table with Chuck and his two sons and myself. I said, where did everybody go? He said, oh, they have choir practice upstairs. They were all in the beer joint drinking until they said it's time for choir practice. And that, that's Germany. You know, they drink beer like you drink pop. The church has zero influence. Zero. They don't even care. If it weren't for them getting a free trip to, to Israel every year, there wouldn't be anybody there. Now, there are exceptions, I'm told, but I've never seen them. I'm telling you that the church in the U.S. is headed in the same direction. One of the reasons is we do not take a strong stand against sin and sinners. We're afraid to cross political lines and there's a great deal of fear. We desperately need the resurrection of a few John the Baptist who will look the politicians straight in the eye and tell them you're going to hell on a skateboard if you don't repent and not be afraid to say it. It cost him his head. But I'll guarantee you he'll have a, a bright and shiny good body and a special place in heaven. The city itself was extremely wealthy, as I said. And the reason that the commentators, the five that agreed with this, said that the American church was a whole lot like the church at Laodicea was because of our wealth. If you've never traveled internationally, you don't know how wealthy you are. We generally spill more here than a lot of people make in most of the places of the earth. You go to Uganda with me and you'll see. We pay our school teachers at the, church, at the school we just started there $300 a month, and they're glad to get it. They're better paid than most. We are extremely wealthy, and the only time we, prepare, we talk about our lack of wealth is when we compare it to somebody we know has got a whole bunch of money. We never count our blessings and realize how greatly blessed we are. People on welfare here would be wealthy in Uganda. I mean wealthy. They could eat at the river once a week. Our attitude that causes us to fall under the umbrella of being like they are, that like they were there in Laodicea, is the attitude we have toward things and money. I told, there's, a, there's an ad on television that I immediately thought about when, in reading the commentaries and what they were saying about the deterioration of our influence for the Lord in our country. You all have seen it. But the reason it's so effective is because, they, and they keep playing it, is because it works. I don't know whether Chris is... Do you remember seeing this? It's my money, and I need it now. We want everything we want now. I, I told Chris, he goofed. I, I wanted one that actually had these good-looking girls saying it. 
but I had to say it and it doesn't do us it's not as effective here in in the New Testament addresses this problem that we all have on all of us do have and especially is it addressed I think probably in the book of um, First Corinthians more effectively than anywhere else. In the fourth chapter of First Corinthians, talking to the Lord is speaking here, he says, So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required of those who have been given a trust that they must prove faithful. Now, the reason I mention this is because most people in the church, and I'm talking about almost 99% of them, actually believe that what they have under their care is theirs. But the Bible is abundantly clear about money and things and who you are. You think you belong to you but you don't. The Bible clearly states this. Before you became a Christian, you were addicted to selfish things of the flesh. You were, I was. It says it this way. You were a slave. You were enslaved. Now what they're doing here is they're using slavery as an illustration. We don't like to do that because we hate slavery so much. But he's using it because in, in the Roman world, six out of ten people were slaves. So using it as an illustration was an effective tool. And you all have seen it. They made a really good movie years ago. I think Kirk Douglas played in it of, of a, the only almost successful slave rebellion. That's what Rome was afraid of all the time, of a slave rebellion. It was led by a... Uh, a gladiator by the name of Spartacus. It was about 70 B.C. It came close to being successful. If you saw the movie, you'd see that the highways, after they captured Spartacus, who was a world, who was a famous gladiator, he, along with thousands of others, lined the highways as they hung on the cross. They, and so slave markets, and we had ours here. Baltimore, believe it or not, and that's one of the reasons why today the people are making fun of the church. The biggest slave market in the United States was in Baltimore, Maryland. And it wasn't Maryland then. It was Maryland. It was named that as the primary place where the Catholic folks came when they came from Western Europe. Because they're the number of them they were either Lutherans or, or Catholics. And the Catholics all came to Mary land. We call it Maryland today, and we don't think much about it. But can you imagine the most religious place in the Catholic Church had the largest slave market in the world? And people were getting stinking rich in England as a result of it. It's because of this that he continues to say here, but you, verse 17, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But Jesus says, but you do not realize that you're wretched and pitiful, and poor, and blind, and naked in the sight of God. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Now, every one of these things that he mentioned here is something that is well known to everybody there in the city of Laodicea. First of all, Laodicea was a city 
of great wealth, as we already said, and it was a banking center. In fact, people would come from all over the world from different governments to cash their checks to get gold. It was also a place of manufacturing of cloth. And in that particular area, all of their sheep were black. And that black cloth was world-renowned. It was a manufacturing center for cloth. And he makes reference to this by saying, but instead of wearing the black that you're so noted for, in the kingdom of God were you to repent, you would be able to wear white clothing, always an indication of what purity. So he's using that local problem, uh, that local thing of, of being a center of cloth manufacturing, like southeastern United States used to be before it all went to China or somewhere else. Then the other thing that they were noted for was it was a, uh, they had a great medical school there, and they had a specialty. Their specialty was for eye ear. That was their eye ear specialty. And they had developed a salve that they sold that looked like a little loaf of bread, that, um, a teeny, teeny loaf of bread that they sold for quite a bit of money that was used for the eyes and for the ears. And that's why he says to them, that's why he marks this, he says, and salve for your eyes and for your ears, and for, for your eyes and ears, because he's referencing what everybody knows they're noted for. But for the work in the kingdom of God, it's useless. It also was a large Jewish population. They actually at one time passed a law to keep the Jews from sending so much gold back to Israel to pay their temple tax because all Jews are required even today to pay a, a temple tax. So if you've noticed here, what he's done is he's taken, an, and the reason this becomes important is because there are certain people who, who don't do their homework who are saying all this, this, all of this stuff was said to re reflect to something way off in the future. It wasn't in the future. This was exactly, everybody there knew exactly what they were saying and what they were trying, and the lesson they were trying to be taught. They understood that. And then Jesus says something that's hard for us to handle, but we know it's true. He said, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. He's saying to those folks, even though you're beyond, you've deteriorated to the place where <clears throat> you're beyond me being able to compliment you, I still love you. I want you to know that. And for your sake, please repent. Turn away from being worldly and seek first the kingdom of God. That's the message I think we desperately need to hear in the U.S. Turn away. We've got too many religions who say, come to Christ and get rich. I say, come to Christ and receive eternal life. And I make you no promises about economics. And then it ends up with, a, with something that, that people have distorted. The picture here that you often see is a picture of Christ standing, knocking on the door. And people have used that as a mechanism for evangelism. Christ is knocking on the door of people's hearts, wanting to come in. That's not the picture here at all. The picture here in the text is Christ is knocking on the door of the church and wanting in. That's the picture here. It's the church at Laodicea that he's talking about. And they're going on doing, maybe doing a lot of good things. But the Lord is not involved. I'm not for sure, and this is just a speculation on my part. I'm not so sure, but maybe. Maybe we need to reinstitute the old prayer meeting 
where people come together and fall on their knees and pray and spend time together just to make sure that we are connected with the Lord and with each other. I don't know that that would accomplish anything, but I'm a little bit desperate in trying to figure out what do we do so that people seek the kingdom of God with the same enthusiasm that they seek wealth for their own selves. I hope you understand that's a really serious situation. Because you see, we assume in a land where freedom is such a big issue, and it's important, but we assume I'm my own, and we emphasize I'm my own man, and I'm this, and I'm that. But the Bible says, if you are a born again Christian, you're not your own. You belong to somebody. And we're going back to the slave market now. Because when you were a slave to the natural desires of the flesh and did just whatever you wanted to, you were addicted. You were addicted to the selfish desires. You were a slave to those desires. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took your place on the cross. And, and when he paid for your sins, you're, he set you free. But you became his because you were bought with a price. And the scripture says, you're not your own. You belong to Jesus. You're not your own. You belong to Jesus. And everything that you have influence over in any way, shape, or form is not yours. A slave has no ownership. You are a steward over God's creation. If you go to the 24th Psalm, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including the people. What is the old song we used to sing after we had had an invitation hymn? Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Your money is not yours. You're a steward over God's money. You think it's yours? No, it isn't. You're a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He owns you and your money. You are a steward. And you will be held accountable for how you handle your money, how you handle your body. Well, here again, let's go back to the, before we leave here, to the sixth chapter, if I remember correctly, of 1 Corinthians, and I think I do. <clears throat> He says, just to save time, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? He's a gift. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So our body and everything that we control, we're to use to honor God. If we indeed are a part of his family. Now this is strong talk and, and, and goes against the grain of those of us who cherish freedom. But the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of this world. And the things of God's kingdom will last. And this world will not. It will fade away. I think it's imperative that we understand who we are. 
We are slaves, bond servants of Jesus Christ. That's how Paul referred to himself. I'm a bond servant of Jesus. I'm bound to Jesus Christ. I'm to honor him with everything, my body, my words, my influence, my money, my possessions, my very life. That's why we exist as believers. And until we get that straight back in our lives, our capacity to influence the world for Jesus will be non-existent. And we become very close to the church at Laodicea. God help us. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us in spite of our self-centeredness, even proud of our self-centeredness at times. Help us, O Lord, to rise above our selfishness and our greed and our desire for more and more things to get to the place where we can sincerely seek first your kingdom And enjoy the righteousness that comes as a gift from you to us because of that. Dismiss us, we pray, Father, from this building to be your representatives, your ambassadors in our community. Help us to begin in our own homes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you all for coming. Have a good week, I pray. And I hope you don't soon forget what I beat you to death with today. And pray for my first wife and I that we can get over this whatever it is that we're struggling with. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.